Welcome, welcome. We're always so happy when you choose to come and spend your evening with us. I'm Joanne Abel, the Humanities Program Coordinator. Milo is Judge Walker's grandson. Um, he has a degree in botany from the Universe, University of North Carolina, the North Carolina State University. He works as a senior ecologist with NatureServe, and they just won a huge MacArthur yeah. Award. Oh, so we want to congratulate him for that. Um, that it is a nonprofit conservation organization whose mission is to provide scientists scientific basis for effective conservation action. He actually has a plant name for him, an endangered um, pine's ground plum. It's an endangered species of a flowering plant that grows in Tennessee's central basin, and it's named for him. And he's also, you're the VP now or the president? Uh, of Eno, VP of the Eno River Association. Welcome with me, Milo Pine. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I, I was talking to Joanne earlier and realized the, the home that Judge Walker lived in when she was uh, on the bench uh, was sort of across the street where Urban Ministries is now. It was on 408 Liberty Street, so we're right here in her, in her old neighborhood. Um, let me... Joanne, did you take the clicker? Okay. <laughs> And it should be on there. There's a red light. Uh, let me try the green light. There we are. Okay. I thought I had it. Oh, there's an echo. Yeah. It's not green. Oh, there we are. Yeah, we have it. All right. All right. Okay, so um, there we are. So Judge Mamie Dad Walker, and we I knew her as Mamie, but we she was known in the community as Judge Walker. She was born Mary Rebecca Dowd and is also known in the record as Mrs. Fielding Lewis Walker, as women were known in those days by their husbands' names. She was a native of Durham and is best known for having been Durham's first juvenile court judge. Uh, and as I would assert, she was the first women, woman judge in North Carolina. And I'd like, before I really begin, I'd like to acknowledge Jean Anderson, whose history of Durham County. Uh, had the basic facts about Judge Walker and her career. Uh, my mother worked with her on her original uh, edition of that. Uh, Councilman Eddie Davis, uh, who encouraged me to do this program and invited me to join him in a program that he did about Elizabeth Catlett. Uh, Gary Cuber, a good friend of mine whose information I relied on uh, to flesh out some of this talk. And I've cited some stuff from Mina Webb. Uh, who was also an acquaintance of mine in her book, The Way We Were Remembering Durham. And, of course, Joanne in the Durham County Library, uh, under whose auspices I'm here tonight, and my mother, Mary Walker Pine, who uh, kept all this stuff. I mean, Ms. Walker was an inveterate uh, collector of all of her newspaper clippings and materials about her career, and we were fortunate that we were able to retain that material and haven't lost it over the years. So I spent the last few evenings rummaging around in my attic and in various uh, file cabinets trying to uh, refresh my memory as to a few facts and scan some images. So I hope you enjoy this program. And this uh, this is Women's History Month, so I'm honored to be the standard bearer for that uh, month event here uh, in March. Uh, and then uh, Women's History Month is in March because of International Women's Day, which was a couple of days ago, so I want to acknowledge that. And Interestingly enough, this holiday was probably most prominently celebrated in the former Soviet Union and related countries, but its origin was actually in the United States with a strike by women workers in about, I believe, 1910 in New York. So it celebrates that labor action. So as I said, we knew her as May May. She was my grandmother. Uh, she was part of our family on Vickers Avenue, where I still, where I currently live from 1950 to 1960. Um, she was... Uh, she was, well, rather, I was 10 years old when she died, and it's just an honor to give this presentation. So uh, thank you so much. That is me. <laughs> and then uh, here's Ms. Walker on our porch at 806 Vickers Avenue with some cousins in the latter years of her life. Uh, so she was born in 1879. So just, I put this up here just to give a little historical perspective. That was about 14 years after the end of the Civil War. So we'll come back to that later. And born in what was then, of course, Orange County, Durham County being founded uh, two years later. Uh, again, for a little background and context, uh, these are her parents. 
Uh, her father had been a Confederate soldier in the 26th North Carolina Regiment, so he was at Gettysburg and was wounded there. He was a manager at W.T. Blackwell uh, and also a Piedmont game warden for the original Audubon Society. And I learned last night reading a biography of his that he did advocate for better school facilities and educational uh, progress. So I think we owe some of Ms. Walker's interest in those issues uh, to his influence. And then uh, my mother and my cousin Meriwether and, of course, myself are also interested in wildlife and, and game. So we sort of uh, bring that down to our generation. Uh, Judge Walker's mother was Susan Lipscomb, who was born at the place called Arrowhead Inn uh, up off of Roxborough Road. It's now bed and breakfast. And that was, of course, then in Orange County. And the Lipscomb family was a very old and influential uh, family in Orange County. So, of course, they, uh, they lived through the Civil War in uh, Central North Carolina. This is an old photo of the Lipscomb home or Airhead Inn. I hear that's a great bed and breakfast if you need a place to put up, put up a visitor or something. And just had to throw in a couple of pictures of the Blackwell factory, an earlier iteration with the three bays, and the later iteration that we're more perhaps more familiar with today. That's down there right across the railroad track at uh, Pettigrew and Blackwell Street. Uh, photos of her as a young lady. And again, we're very fortunate that we've been able to retain so many family photographs. And they must have been, at that time, a rather prosperous family because there are all these nice photographs. And she has a, a nice violin there uh, and, and very nice clothes and stuff. So uh, they must have been one of the more prosperous and prominent families of Durham. But of course, having gone through the Civil War, and then uh, kind of made a comeback, and then, of course, they all went through the Depression, and that's a later part of the story. Uh, apparently, the first woman in Durham to own a bicycle, and this, this photo has been recreated as a stand-up, as a card, stand-up cardboard cutout at the Durham History Hub, so I hope you get a chance to go by there and see that. Um, and this is a real cute photo on the bottom of her with her girlfriend eating a lollipop. Now, I couldn't find my... Reference. There was an article about this bicycle in the Durham Herald at some point many, many years ago, and couldn't find that article buried somewhere in a file folder. But my recollection was the bicycle at that time cost $700. And that was a long time ago, and that now would be about $10,000 in today's money. I, I think I'm right on my numbers, but suffice it to say that that was kind of a big deal. So, so they had some, some resources to expend. And then in 1904, she married Fielding Lewis Walker, Jr., who was, again, a manager at Liggett Myers. So both their husband and uh, father were involved in the tobacco industry, of course, as I reckon everybody was back in those days. So at age 57, he died of a heart attack. And my, my first cousin, uh, Fielding, also Fielding Lewis Walker, Fielding Lewis Walker IV, my cousin, um, when he got to age 58, he was very thankful because both his father and grandfather had died at age 57. Uh, so some, some men are genetically programmed to check out at that time. So I've also passed that threshold, so we're thankful for that. So the significance of the year 1934, she was widowed and appointed juvenile court judge in the same year. Here are pictures of her. Uh, that's her wedding dress uh, on, the, on the left. And another formal outfit. Check out those gloves uh, and the hat on the right. Photos of her slightly older period. Uh, the one on the left is used in um, photographs that used in publications during her school board service. So here's her uh, record, what I'd call her record of public service. Uh, she was um, on the city board of education, and I don't know how that board was selected. If they were appointed by the city, they were probably appointed by the city council. I doubt that it was a public election, but I'm not sure and then a charter member and chair of the City Parks and Recreation Commission from 24 to 33. Uh, so she held these two positions uh, before, before, before becoming judge, and all that sort of ties together in terms of her policies and the things that she advocated for. So she was the first judge of Durham County Juvenile Court, and I think there were only two because the juvenile court got merged with the rest of the court system in the late 60s, I believe. So there was another gentleman named Moore, I believe, who followed her as the juvenile court judge. So notice the, um, 
the, the periodicity of her terms there. There's a gap, and we'll talk more about that later. That's one of the more interesting parts of the story, I believe. She served from 34 to 41 and then had to sit out a year and came back in 42 until she retired in 49. And was sworn in on December 3rd, so that the December, the fact that all this happens in December is also uh, significant. And again, until someone comes up with a countervailing proposal, I shall assert that she was the first female judge in North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's the joke about Eddie. I had to gently correct Eddie on that point, but uh, that's how we became friends. So, again, going up in my, my attic, and I found a stack of messenger yearbooks from Durham High, and I thought, now, this is odd because these yearbooks are from the late 20s and early 30s, and my mother was long gone from Durham High by that point. So I opened them up, and they'd been retained because they were issued during her service on the school board. So there's her picture um, as a school board member. So let me see. Do we have the what is it? Oops. Oh, no. What did I do? There we are. This is the laser button, the little laser button. That. Oh, there we go. So here she is here and here, same photograph. And, of course, she is the only female in this group. Uh, this is a ribbon from an athletic meet of the uh, city schools in 1921. It's in my little case up here that we can look at after the program. So uh, sort of a summary of that, that her, her service on, those, on the Board of Education and the Commission I think made her aware of all these connections among these areas of public policy involving uh, young people and their development as well as the need for public recreation and the impact on youth of all this. The impact on youth of public policy, I guess we could say in a general way, and this prepared her for her service as a juvenile court judge. And during that period, she, of course, she, she was involved with all these other organizations, national organizations uh, that you can see here. Uh, social Work, Recreation Commission, Council of Juvenile Agencies. So she really um, worked to make the, make the juvenile court uh, quite professional and connected with all these other people in those fields. Here she is at a meeting of the, uh, what's, what was called at that time the American uh, Prison Association. It has, goes by this name now. And then other memorabilia. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, there we are. Um, yes. So, again, up in my attic, I found a thing called the Social Register of North Carolina, which is quite a, a valuable resource for looking, looking people up, prominent people of the day. And this lists her, her affiliations, including the United, United Daughters of the Confederacy. And, again, we'll come back to that in a bit. But Board of Directors of the Southern Conservatory of Music, the Wright Refuge, uh, which I guess is what became the Wright School. I'm not clear about that. Board of Education, Recreation Commission, Juvenile Court, first woman juvenile court judge in North Carolina, and 408 Liberty Street. So that's 1936. <coughs> and these are the portraits. One of these we used in the promos for this event. Uh, these were taken during her tenure as a judge. They look like they're from the same uh, sitting, slightly different views. So again, we're fortunate to have those photos. This is her badge uh, and a little uh, a little. Uh, button or insignia from what's called the Police Athletic League. So that's a nice brass badge that she could wear as an official of the court. So uh, again, a lot of this is well documented in uh, the history of Durham County and on some other websites. And again, I was very gratified to realize, and I've not been in the new courthouse, but there's a picture of her in the new courthouse on that wall of all the pictures of people, that mosaic. And if you're like me, you don't have occasion to go to the courthouse, fortunately, but uh, so I've not seen this. But so she's, and there's a website about that, and there's various websites that uh, go into some detail about her career. Um, but she, of course, emphasized prevention and treatment rather than punishment of juvenile delinquency. And she built these coalitions and worked with groups, uh, we'd say, on both sides of the tracks in the Caucasian and African American communities to reach out and develop coalitions that would uh, help youth and was instrumental in establishing the safety patrol and, and these uh, cooperative councils to augment the court's work and advocated for a youth home because uh, there's more to say about that. But the 
uh, youthful offenders were confined sort of in like the basement of the jail or something. It was kind of medieval conditions for these youthful offenders. So she worked very hard to correct that. Um, and again, back to the uh, the parks, parks and Recreation Commission, she believed that supervised play for children was preventative and corrective of antisocial behavior and was a leader in developing playgrounds in Durham and helped form youth clubs, including the uh, Avery, uh, which is now the Boys and Girls Club. So there was a February 1941 report, and some excerpts from it were given, and there's a book here about the juvenile courts in North Carolina that, without mentioning the county, uh, recount some of the material from this 1941 report, which again, I probably have a copy of in my attic, but I haven't found it yet, <laughs> um, cited these poor conditions and lack of supervision of the youthful detainees. And uh, quoting from that, it said there was constant surreptitious contact between children and adult prisoners. There was an attempted suicide of an African-American youth. And then uh, in response to this, this was all, in, this was, documented in the 1941 report, she advocated for a county youth home with, a, with more appropriate conditions. Uh, there were numerous newspaper articles, and again, she was great at getting the story out uh, So, and kept the clipping. So there are all these clippings uh, that were very, um, you know, promoting, shall we say, of her work um, and her work with all these national organizations, and she was in magazines and was quite well known at the time. Uh, both in Durham and I think across the country. Um, so again, a little more about that. She sought, she, when she came into office then, she sought counsel from the National Association to try to develop professional standards here in Durham, this National Probation and Parole Association. So she, her policies were based on this uh, work that was being done in social work across the country. And then her program, her implementation of those standards in Durham became models for similar programs across the nation. And this is a critical point. So these were in the days of segregation, but she organized two coordinating councils, one for whites and one for blacks, as auxiliaries to the juvenile court. So she made a great effort to, uh, you know, despite the color line, to work across that and, and organize people all across the community and developed a lot of relationships. So I think this is a very interesting piece of paper uh, and a little hard to read this, but this says Juvenile Court, Durham City and County Coordinating Council for Leisure Time of Youth, plan arranged by Mrs. F.L. Walker, Judge of Juvenile Court. Here's a central committee uh, with public officials, but including the principal of Negro schools and representative from Negro City Club. Then here's the white organization, then here's the Negro organization. So they're segregated, they're in two columns, but there was a great effort to include all these groups. Now the date on this is 1935, so the Durham Committee on the Affairs or the Negro Affairs as it was called then is not listed because it had, been, had not been really formed yet. But here's the, uh, here's the tennis club, the Algonquin Tennis Club of course is in here, and that was where the first meeting of the uh, Durham Committee on Negro Affairs was held. So I found that of great interest. Um, redundant, but uh, again, develop playgrounds and all these sort of stuff. Uh, then the John Avery Boys Club, uh, she partnered with W.D. Hill, uh, who's the namesake of the W.D. Hill Recreation Center on Table Street. Uh, he was an executive of NC Mutual Life Insurance Company, which of course is where a lot of the leadership of the African, Comer African American community came from at that time. They worked together to create the John Avery Boys Club. Uh, which is now the John Avery Boys and Girls Club, uh, still on Pedro Street. So another example of her outreach, and she did a great deal of public speaking. Um, supposedly, according to one thing I read, she delivered over 450 uh, addresses during her term of office. Here she was a principal speaker at a session at uh, NCCN, which now we call uh, NCCU. This was the North Carolina College for Negroes. This was the North Carolina Federation of Negro Women's Club. Uh, so she, she spoke to that group. Okay, the reappointment controversy. So that gap in her tenure. And I had um, heard bits and pieces of this story growing up, but I did, did a little more digging and learned a couple of interesting things. So uh, when, she was a, when she was appointed in 1934, Apparently, a number of people felt that this other gentleman, uh, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner should have been uh, selected. 
and he was a director or former director of the YMCA. I'm having a little hard time finding out much about his YMCA career because he was known for another very interesting thing, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, but his name was put forward, he was denied the appointment, but then in 1941, uh, right a few days before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a vote was taken, and it was a secret vote, a vote of the combined membership of the city council and county commission, and with that warning, uh, they uh, voted her out by a 10 to 3 vote. Now, what was a little bit um, suspicious about this, there had not been, apparently not been a solicitation. Normally they would solicit a uh, sort of uh, request to be appointed, and there would be a sort of public process where people would submit an application, and then a vote would be taken, and the uh, candidates would be known. Apparently Mr. Warner did not submit an application. Uh, they just, in secret, uh, voted him in by this 10 to 3 vote, and that hit everyone like a ton of bricks, because the assumption was that Ms. Walker would be uh, re- uh, reappointed. So the her her ouster led to immediate outrage uh, among both races in Durham, and then a campaign <laughs> was launched for her reappointment. Now, thankfully, we have got uh, the record. Some most of the Carolina Times are online, which makes for some very interesting reading. So about a year ago, when I was going to do this program, I went and uh, googled not Google, but put her name in the search box for the Carolina Times and found this. So you can see some of the rhetoric that uh, Lewis Austin employed. So note, this was the day before Pearl Harbor. Editorial in the Carolina Times. Big headline, and I've got a scan of it on the next slide, but big headline, the Durham Gestapo. <laughs> the tragedy which has occurred is discouraging and devastating. The most revolting act of a group of public officials we have ever witnessed. It makes us wonder if we are not becoming overwhelmed by the rising tide of Nazism. <laughs> The secretness, the suddenness with which the city council strikes here of late resembles the Gestapo of Germany. So he was like, he was completely outraged. This is hard to call someone worse than to call, call the whole city council and <laughs> commission a bunch of Nazis, right? <laughs> to stab in the back this fine Christian woman is a vile act that we Negroes who have heard the doctrine of respect for woman and preached by white men all our lives cannot understand. <laughs> And then concluding, when the next city and county elections roll around, the voters of this community have a solemn duty to perform. So, yes. <laughs> so then, th then this went on for a year. So uh, in terms of the, the shock with her being removed. And here's the editorial. So again, the Durham Gestapo and all this good stuff. So um, it was a rather lengthy, it kind of goes on and on. But I pulled out the most salient portions. So in these, the following December, she was restored to office by a vote of 10 to 7. So that still was, you know, a little bit close. But uh, she got back in and then was reappointed without opposition uh, the following years from 43 to 48. Now, I, if you go back to the timeline, the 1941 report on the poor jail conditions was probably one of the most, I'd say, significant things that came out of her tenure. And that was just a few months before she was, she was removed from office. So I wonder if she tore off too big of a scab and was uh, was sort of retaliated against for uh, detailing all these poor conditions in the incarceration of young people. <coughs> and then this is interesting because I think I remember, this name was familiar to me, I just found this last night, uh, Dr. J.M. Hubbard. And I remember Dr. Hubbard, an African-American gentleman uh, who came to visit our home at some point, you know, when I was eight or nine, uh, years old, but this uh, Dr. Hubbard says, I'm returning now the information in form of clippings, news articles, and some personal letters you so graciously accorded me when we were in our fight for the juvenile court muddle. I have used them, my friends have enjoyed them, and having served their purpose with us, you who earned them by your own efforts should repossess them. I think they contain the greatest tribute that can come to anyone. So this is just evidence of her you know, organizing with these prominent members of the African American community to get her to become restored to office. This is dated June 1943, so that's six months after uh, her reappointment. So the gentleman who uh, was was all, was passed over in 34 and was in office for a year, I was prepared to not like this guy. Uh, <laughs> thought he would be some some hack or something that they put in there, but I I Google this name and discovered this other person, but apparently it's the same person, a totally different career track for this gentleman, 
was a very prominent folklorist. Have, have other people heard of this Frank Warner? I, 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 I knew about Pete Seeger and I knew about the other collectors of folk music uh, back in the day, but I had never run across this gentleman's name. Now, apparently he was married twice, so this is a little confusing. The Frank and Ann Warner papers are in the Duke University Library. He lived at 119 Lynch Street with Mabel, presumably his first wife back in the teens. He was at Duke University. Uh, and then following this judge business, uh, he had an active life with uh, Ann of collecting, recording, and producing music. Um, from the eastern seaboard areas from New Hampshire and North Carolina. He has two sons, one of whom does a program related to the music that he collected. Uh, so maybe we can get, get them to come give a show here or something. I, and, and I've gotten in touch with one of the sons uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, the first time I've ever used LinkedIn for anything useful, but uh, <laughs> I found this guy and I said, so I said, oh, I wonder about your father, his music, blah, blah. And then he says, oh, that's great. And I said, by the way, was he ever a juvenile court judge in Durham? <laughs> I'm waiting to see if it, I mean, we, everyone online seems to have linked these, the Frank Warner of Lynch Street and the juvenile court with the Frank Warner of the uh, music collecting. So we assume that they are the same person. But it's tricky with there being two different wives and so on and so forth. Here is Mr. Warner, who was born in 1903 and lived about 75 years, having passed away in 1978 with his banjo. Um, and opendurham.org, acknowledged here, uh, has this about Frank Warner. Uh, he, was in, he was in the YMCA. So that's, that's the thing these, apparently, these two Frank Warners have in common. They're both involved with the YMCA. He's far better known as one of the leaders in the folk music revival. Um, married 1935, collected all these songs. The most famous of the songs was Frank Prophet's Tom Dooley and the Kingston Trio, if you remember that. Uh, and they made sure that Prophet finally received credit for the song because the Kingston Trio picked it up and uh, was not giving Frank Prophet any royalties, even though he had written it. The other famous song is He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. So that's the story there. So I, I wasn't looking. Did, did anybody, anybody else know about Frank Warner? Did you, I think I know his son. Oh, you do? Oh, really? Garrett? Yeah, his son or? went to Duke and, and was a prominent folk music player. Okay. He lives up in the Northeast. Okay, that was, that's Frank Jr. Now the other son is here, G Garrett or Gary. Garrett, I knew too. And he's he's here. He's he's local. He is, he wasn't, but maybe he is. Now. Okay, I, I, according to my information, he may be local. So, anyway, so yeah, that's that's all very interesting. I'm I'm just I just want to be sure it's the same guy. It's got to be. George Holt from Prophet Point Street is by this direction. Who? George Holt. Oh, okay, okay. Well, very good. And then this is another. I wish I knew a little more details about this. Again, there was an article somewhere in the Durham Herald back in the day about this pair of shoes. But uh, my, my interpretation of the story, and I don't have the name of the uh, young man to whom the shoes belong, but this young man came into Judge Walker's court uh, for some offense, and she was horrified by the condition of his shoes. So presumably they got him a new pair of shoes, and then... Uh, and then the shoes are not in my attic. I don't know where they are, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they were there. But the photographs were made of them, and then a woodcut uh, was made by an artist from Connecticut named Claire Layton. If anyone's familiar with her work, she did this wood She block. lived in Durham. Oh, okay. <laughs> and she did a lot of woodcuts around the uh, New Hope Creek on the way to Chapel Hill. Oh, okay, okay. And she lived on the old uh, Chapel Hill Road. Okay. I, I figured she's probably in Durham at some point, so that's great. Uh, and then, so this became sort of Ms. Walker's uh, personal symbol. She used it on book plates and on greeting cards, and I've got an wow. example of that up here in my, really in my case. But these were battered shoes that belonged to a youthful offender, and I just feel like this was, quote, emblematic of poverty leading to crime. So, th so this became her, her symbol for her, uh, for her efforts. And then she passed away in 1960s, 1960 rather. Here are the uh, obituaries from uh, the Herald and the Carolina Times. Same headline, friend of wayward youngsters buried in Durham funeral. She's buried in Maplewood. Um, and then messages of condolence, again, from uh, leaders in the white and black communities, uh, Congressman Carl Durham and uh, Asa Spaulding, A.T. Spaulding. 
And George Lowry wrote a tribute article to her in 1985, uh, and again said was not a lawyer and supplemented her meager salary from an income of her own, you know, to pay for the uh, things involved with the withholding office. Her program of rehabilitation was so successful that it drew national and international praise. And then, a, I don't know who this was, but an official of the National Youth Administration, that was one of the New Deal agencies, uh, gave a tribute to her in a, in a radio address. And then a, another anecdote, additional anecdote, this is from Mina Webb's book uh, there, which I highly recommend. Uh, she, she was a formidable chaperone, these are my words, but a formidable <laughs> chaperone at parties of the Embassy Club where single 20-somethings met in Durham in the late 1930s. This would have been the people of my parents' generation. So Mina Webb recounts that with ladies such as Mamie Dad Walker sitting on the sidelines, no gentleman would dare to bring along a hip blast. So Coca-Cola's that relieved that, that that relieved thirsty dancers would not be spiked and that decorum would thereby <laughs> reign. <laughs> and then the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So, so I think th this is a bit of an aside, but I think it's noteworthy in terms of her uh, involvement with so many people in the African American community uh, that given her background uh, of her, her class and the period she grew up in, she was very involved in the UDC. So she was the actual daughter of a Confederate Army veteran, as I mentioned. She was very proud of her father's service and became a member of the UDC and enrolled her daughter, my mother, in the children of the Confederacy. So I remember growing up in a house with photos of and books about Robert E. Lee and other uh, Confederate heroes. On the coming of the Civil Rights Movement and the adoption of Confederate symbolism by the rightest racists of that era changed how we must view this symbolism today. And that's what happened to me. At about age 11, I realized that there was a real problem with sort of the, the Confederate nostalgia versus when you read in the paper about a, a white citizens council rally and they would be flying Confederate flags. And I kind of had to, uh, you know, consign the Confederate symbolism to, to history rather than the uh, current era. But I think that's very interesting. Here's the Children of the Confederacy uh, certificate. Uh, and, and the other thing interesting about this is it's the Vance County chapter. So at some point, they lived up in Henderson. Um, I guess um, Mr. Walker moved around with the tobacco company. So they lived in several houses in Durham, but were in Henderson. And my mother was actually born in South Boston, Virginia. So they moved around a bit, and I don't have all those addresses or know exactly uh, where they were when. I have a letter, found an envelope dated 1908 uh, from a Durham address, but then in 1910, uh, my mother was born in, uh, in South Boston. So in summary, uh, so here we're, I don't know if I'm ahead of time or behind time, but uh, uh, anyway, we're reaching a conclusion. So. I would say that she set a standard for creative solutions to problems of juvenile delinquency and crime. She was recognized and respected as a national leader in these issues. She reached across the color line in an era of racial segregation. She secured her reappointment through an interracial coalition. And she worked with leaders of the African American or at the time Negro community to find solutions to common problems in Durham. And most or many of the problems she uh, was confronted, she, the problems she confronted are still with us in today's headlines. So it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, comely, comely challenge and all that. Crime by young people, today including murder frequently of other young people. Poor stewardship of parks and recreation resources. There's a current need of a penny for parks program in an attempt to address this deficit. Continual need for youth programs and mentoring. Uh, you hear about this all the time. It comes up in community meetings, and our public officials are trying to address it. Need for parents to engage in their children's education and need for resources to combat poverty. A recognition that social and economic circumstances contribute to juvenile crime. And an ongoing need to keep juveniles out of the adult penal system, and even the controversy about uh, sort of execution of, of young people and at what age uh, can the death penalty be applied. Uh, and the, the need to balance punishment and rehabilitation in, um, in the uh, justice system. So, thank you. And I and we have a time for questions. Tyler, did she keep a diary? 
You know, there there is a notebook, and I had this again, a notebook in the attic, uh, not very used, opened it up, tried to read it. She had a sort of a florid script. It takes a little practice to read. But when she came into office, she began keeping a very detailed journal of all her interactions, all her meetings, her interactions with the youthful offenders, in a lot of detail, but it doesn't go on for maybe more than a month, a month or two. So it was just, she, she tried to maintain a journal, but it didn't, it didn't last. But, but there is the beginnings of a journal, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, 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 yeah, talk to the microphone, because it's all being, hopefully it's all being recorded. Oh, what school, oh. Um, tell me something about her education. Oh, thank you, because I wasn't really clear about that. She went through the, the Durham, of course, the Durham City Schools, uh, and then was a Greensboro Academy, some, I'm forgetting the exact name, some Greensboro Female Academy, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. That would have been, you know, in the 1900s. She would have been 21 in 1900. So maybe that was like an advanced high school or prep school. Mm -hmm. So she did not go, I don't think she went to an actual university or college. But she did been, not study law. Oh, no, no, did not study law. And again, may not even have, an, have a bachelor's degree. So I'm not quite, uh, just the information I saw just again last night and didn't write down, but Durham City Schools and Greensboro Female Academy. So, hey. Uh, yes, uh, can you scroll back to the letter from um, Dr. Hubbard? Oh, sure. Well, it just says NC Mutual Building. So that was his office, his office stationery. That would have been the building on, on uh, Cork, or, I'm sorry, not Cork and Parrish. I believe this gentleman may be the father of uh, Dr. Linda Hubbard. Oh. Uh, who uh, lives here in Durham and worked for, worked for the Durham Public Schools and now is an official over at St. Justin's in Dallas. Oh, wow. J M. Yeah, okay. I think it may have been the grandfather. Okay. But yeah, in turn, and the other interesting thing about this, I mean, I, and I remember remember this very vividly when Dr. Hubbard, uh, you know, when Dr. Hubbard came to call, you know, of course he came to the front door. And I, but I gather in some parts of town, the African American people did not go to the front door of the white people's house. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he was received just like any other issue. So. So I grew up in, a, in, 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 you know, learned things at that time about relations among uh, people of different color. Other questions? I'm curious about this. Oh, yeah, please. When she went to the Durham Public Schools, did she have any experience whenever she went to Durham High School? Was that whenever Durham High School was in what is now the off campus area? It would have probably been before. Well, I said Durham High School. I think the only reference I had just said the Durham City Schools. So who yeah. knows what? Well, I, I, if I did, I misspoke because my, my source was not that specific. Okay. Because again, that would have been in what the period eighteen, the, the late eighteen uh, ninety, you know, the mid eighteen nineties. Because uh, she was born in seventy nine, so she could have been in high school, whatever we call high schools now. I mean, again. It's a little unclear to me because it wasn't quite the same situation. I would assume she went to the elementary schools in Durham and then went to this Greensboro Female Academy, probably for what we would call high school now, a more advanced, uh, a more you know higher higher level of training. Because again, they were a very prosperous family, so they could have sent her to the uh, Female Academy in Greensboro. And I don't know what the school was, but uh, yeah, this was way before the Durham High was in the uh, uh, was in the uh, city hall. That's probably where my mother went, would have gone to Durham High. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. Yes. You said something about uh, you weren't sure how she got on the Recreation Commission. Well, I wasn't sure. No, I, I think I was more unclear how the school board was selected. <coughs> the Recreation Commission would have undoubtedly been appointed by the city council. Yeah, it was in, inside one of the newspaper clippings that she wasn't. Oh, okay. She wasn't, that she was appointed. Yeah. In Okay, that makes sense. And I don't know about the, uh, but I just was speculating on the means of selecting the school board, but I select it was appointed, but it was appointed as well. Um, Milo, do you have any way of knowing how she became interested? Oh, first of all, was it common, was it uh, unusual for someone to be a judge and not have a legal degree at that time? 
Well, I think it was different because this was a juvenile court judge. Okay, okay. So the requirements okay. must have been different. But of course, everything was probably looser back then. Yeah, that would make sense. You would think of Roy Bean, the west of the Picos, sitting up <laughs> on a barrel in a saloon or something. I mean, you know, I mean, it was a little more wild and woolly. But uh, certainly in retrospect, it seems unusual to us today. But it may, there may have been other judges who, who did not have law degrees. And were you able to find out anything about, would give you a clue about how she became interested in all the all of the achievements that she made in her life? Was there anything that you, any records that you might have had that would have propelled her to that path? Because it just seems so incredible. Well, the one snippet I got was, again, that her, this bi biography of her father, that's just two pages typewritten, undated, unauthored, no authorship attribution of specifically mentioned that he was interested in education okay. issues. So that's all I can imagine. He he died in 1906. So he would have died when she was 25, I guess, or 27, something like that. So, but I I, I would just assume that she perhaps acquired that interest from him. But that that was the starting point was getting on the school board. Right. But that preceded the, the recreation okay. division. So she was, so she was involved on in the school board first and then chair, founding member and chair of the recreation commission. That's incredible. So that's, it's all very interesting yeah. to put the timeline together and get all these people. Yeah, Norman. Yeah, Layton, the shoes. Yes. Uh, she was a wood engraver, not a wood carver. Okay. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, when you engrave a work, you cut against the grain oh. at the end of the wood. Okay. And uh, it's a lot more difficult. And she was extremely successful. Oh, yeah. She was English. She came to the States. She did a uh, <coughs> series on fishermen from the Northeast. Oh, okay. And uh, she was very popular here in Durham. Yeah. She lived on the old Hope Valley Road going out past the graveyard where Dr. Shepherd is buried, but it's not our Dr. Shepherd. It's central, it's another shepherd. Just beyond that is a log cabin, and she lived in that. Well, it's a house, it's a log house, I guess. Okay. Oh. Now, where, so how, where on Hope Valley Road? What? Where Woodcroft? Going toward Woodcroft? It's going toward Woodcroft. It's not that far. Yeah. yeah. There is that little graveyard. It's on the little graveyard on the road. Little, 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 little graveyard, yeah. Little graveyard drive. Okay. Right past Dover. I haven't been recently. Right oh, man. Right okay. Huh. Well, again, I encourage you to come up and look at my memorabilia case because I've got the actual wood block. I've got the wood block and the uh, the book plate and some of the cards. Anyway, so. Yeah, Gordon, all right. Yeah, great, great talk. I love the documents. <laughs> That's uh, a compliment that coming from Gordon. Gordon's <laughs> a real historian. I'm no, really no, a dilettante. No, no. <laughs> We're both historians. Um, so. A couple questions about the reappointment controversy. Uh, and the, I know you speculated that, that you thought that that was around, you know, a very, she, she took a critical stance around conditions for youthful offenders. I was wondering if there's any, you know, is, is how is race and gender playing out there? Do you have any idea? I mean, is, is she stepping out of, you know, what is expected of her, you know, from the boys club um, or, and then also, because it does sound like she, and, and Durham has a long history of connections between black and white working across uh, lines to a certain extent, um, but does she take it one step too far for their, in, in their eyes? I'm just curious. No, that's, that, that's in line with my thinking. Yeah, when I put it together in the timeline, I thought, now that, it's certainly noteworthy that the report comes out in the middle of, you know, middle of 41, and then at the end of 41 is this this turnaround, which really was, as the editorial indicated, was done in secret without warning, so on and so forth. I've not gone back to look if there was any editorial <laughs> expression in the Herald or the Sun of the time. That would be another thing to check, the papers around that day. That was actually very interesting. Yeah. Lewis Austin was known for being very outspoken. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in a great way. You know, but, uh, yeah, I'd be curious, I just, especially about the gender piece yeah. of it and whether or not she was just threatening even though she's establishing herself. Right, right. Yeah, so. But certainly, because the conditions were so bad, and then it got to the point where there was that, that attempted suicide. Or what, and I'm not really clear, I think in Gene Anderson's book, it says the, the, the person actually, well, it says they hung themselves. It does not say that they died, they could 
know if they hung themselves and were rescued or how it worked out, but in the report uh, quote, it was called an attempted suicide. But it, conditions were that bad, and of course the, uh, the white kids were kept upstairs and the black kids were kept in the basement, kind of like in a dungeon, and they were just, you know, it's a San Jose medieval. Um, so they really needed a, needed a youth home. And there was no supervision, and of course no, certainly no rehabilitation or no kind of training or anything. And, and there were, and you get allusions to, uh, I think in her notebook, and again, I didn't try to transcribe any of that, but uh, you get allusions to mental health issues. There were people, and then she just wrote, well, this mother is crazy, and da da You know, it was, this was all very informal. It wasn't like it was just notes to herself. And she said, well, this woman's crazy, and we've got to do something about this child that, you know, she's not capable of caring for them. So all those issues, again, like today, the issues of mental health, uh, of, you know, people that are not mentally completely well getting in violation of the law and then not knowing what to, what to do with it. So these same issues are with us today to uh, perhaps a greater extent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let's look at that other question. Well, thank you for your interest. Thank, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you I want Lynn Richardson just snuck in right after I finished talking, and she wants to talk a little bit about the North Carolina election. Hi, I just want to give a, a brief commercial about the North Carolina collection at the Durham County Library. Um, our primary mission is to preserve um, Durham City and County history. Uh, we're doing that in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the ways we're doing it is by collecting the papers of individuals and organizations. Uh, we have a few things from Milo's uh, dad, uh, here and what he's found in his attic. I'm going to be talking to him. <laughs> I've got a pile of stories. <laughs> we have Norm Pendergraft's papers, who's back here. He was head of the North Carolina Central University Art Museum for years and was a, a professor there and had an illustrious career in other ways. And was uh, born here. And was born in Durham. <laughs> yes, that's the other thing. He's a Durham years. native, which is, which is um, nice to have materials related to that. So if you, if you do have things or if you know of people who have materials, please, please get in touch with me. And we do have an initiative right now called the African American Manuscripts Initiative. We are, uh, Lois Deloach, for those of you who know her, is in the community about 15 hours a week looking to bring in material specifically from the African American community. We've got some wonderful things and we're looking for more. Um, so um, please, if you have questions or want to do research on Durham, come to the North Carolina Collection. And if you know of things that would be useful to add to the collection, please get in touch. Thank you.